Hello, this presentation is for students. It's intended for students taking Anatomy and Physiology 2 with Gina Piscatelli at Madison Area Technical College. We will talk about blood vessels in this presentation. Specifically, we'll look at uh, the different types of blood vessels we have in our circulatory system. Then um, we'll look at the structures and functions of these different types. And finally, in part four, I'll introduce a few disorders that are common in the clinical environment. To part one, the types of vessels. There are three types of blood vessels found in the body. These are arteries, capillaries, and veins. The diagram on this slide also shows another type of vessel, but this vessel does not carry blood Rather, it carries lymphatic fluid, and it's shown in green. So in this diagram, arteries are shown in red. Capillaries are shown in both red and blue, which indicates the degree of oxygenation. And blue vessels are considered veins and returning blood to the heart. Since you've already studied heart anatomy, you're familiar with the fact that arteries and veins have opposing functions. Arteries conduct blood away from the heart. The capillaries exchange, allow the exchange of materials between blood and the fluid in between cells known as the interstitial fluid. And then the veins condu conduct the blood back towards the heart. These different categories then perform very different functions. <clears throat> Arteries are often called resistance vessels because their walls have abundant smooth muscle, which can constrict, we call this vasoconstriction, that narrows the lumen of the vessel and resists blood flow. However, also present in the wall of arteries are elastic fibers which can recoil after they've been stretched. This recoil of an artery will help promote blood flow. Blood flows into smaller arteries and smaller and smaller branches, eventually reaching capillaries, the smallest vessel type. The walls of capillaries are very thin and therefore most easily allow the exchange of materials between blood and the interstitial fluid, or vice versa. Not all capillaries are identical, however, and they vary in what they allow to cross. That is to say that not all capillaries are equally permeable to all substances. And we will discuss this more throughout the semester as we look at capillary beds in different organs and different organ systems. Lastly, blood flows from capillary beds into venules that merge into larger veins. Veins are often called capacitance vessels, as in capacity, due to the volume of blood that they can hold. They contain the most volume of blood at any one time because their walls are quite distensible, more than arteries are. There's somewhere between four and six liters of blood in an adult's body. From this diagram, you can see that at any one time, 88% of that volume of blood is contained within vessels of the systemic circuit, and that's shown here in green. And 12% is contained within vessels of the pulmonary circuit, and that's shown in light blue. If we just look at the systemic circuit, look at how much blood the veins hold, 60% of total blood volume. That's why the veins are called capacitance vessels and sometimes they're called a blood reservoir. Also note in this diagram that only 15% of blood volume is contained within the systemic arteries shown in orange 
and only 8% is contained within the heart at any one time, and that's shown in teal. Now that 8% would be in coronary vessels. Now there are anatomical differences between veins and arteries that accounts for this distribution of blood, and we'll talk about that in the next topic. So on to the structure and histology of vessel walls. There is a basic scheme to the structure of a vessel wall. This diagram shows that a vessel could have up to three different layers. These layers from superficial to deep are one, the tunica externa, shown in purple, two, the tunica media, shown in blue, and three, the tunica interna, shown in red. Now arteries and veins have all three of these layers, but capillaries will only have the innermost tunica interna, just one cell layer thick. Also shown in the diagram are the types of tissues, or on the slide anyway, are the types of tissues present in each layer. So from superficial to deep, let's note the tissues that are present in each layer. Significantly in the tunica externa, we find collagen fibers and connective tissue that allows for support. Then in the tunica media, we find smooth muscle, which allows vasoconstriction or vasodilation. And then in the tunica interna, we have epithelial tissue and specifically simple squamous, very flat cells. This minimizes the friction as blood flows within the arteries and veins, it builds up, friction builds up, but in the capillaries, this friction is diminished. <clears throat> it's also diminished just by the presence of simple squamous epithelium in general, but it's an ideal tissue um, for diffusion. We will be looking in detail at the different types of arteries and different types of veins, but first, there's a few generalizations that I want to make sure you understand for each category of vessel. The walls of arteries are much thicker than the walls of veins. This is due mainly to the, the extensive tunica media. The tunica media in arteries allows them to function in regulating blood flow because they can perform vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And of course, because there are elastic fibers present in the walls of the arteries, when blood flows into an artery and stretches the arterial wall, there's recoil that helps propel the blood along. Veins have um, very large lumens, but thinner walls than arteries do. This is what makes them high capacity or a blood reservoir, as I previously mentioned. What I have not mentioned yet is that veins do have valves that prevent the backflow of blood. We will see a picture of a valve in a little bit. This aids in returning blood to the heart. And capillaries the most important thing to know is that they are one cell layer thick composed of only the tunica interna, which allows for diffusion of materials. So there are different types, of course, of arteries. We name them differently and different types of veins. There's also different types of capillaries, but that's not shown in this picture. This diagram depicts how the sizes of arteries and veins change throughout the systemic circulation. So as blood is pumped from the heart, it goes into the largest uh, vessel called the aorta. It's the largest artery and the largest vessel in our bodies. The aorta diverges or diverges to give off several large arteries, which then diverge into medium-sized and smaller arteries. Eventually, the smallest type of artery is called an arteriole. These large, uh, I'm sorry, these arterioles can help divert blood if they vasoconstrict from one organ to another. 
Then the smallest vessel shown in this diagram is the capillary. And blood returns to the heart when several capillaries merge to form a venule, which is roughly the same size as an arteriole. And the venules merge to form small veins and then large veins. And then finally converging into the two largest veins, the superior and inferior vena cava, that carry blood back to the chambers of the heart, actually the right atrium of the heart. Looking more closely at the different types of arteries first, we see that the histology changes somewhat as size changes in arteries. First, remember all arteries have all three tunics, tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica interna. The largest arteries closest to the heart have an extensive tunica media with elastin so that they are able to expand during ventricular systole, which is when the blood's pumped from the heart, and recoil when the blood needs to fill into the heart. I mean, it needs to go back into the heart. So they respond to high pressure quite well because of that elastin. Medium-sized arteries are sometimes called muscular arteries. Their tunica media is the thickest of all the three types and is very important in vasoconstriction, vasodilation. I don't think that's something that you have to know for an exam, but it is true. Limited vasoconstriction helps to, or limiting blood flow through vasoconstriction, um, helps to distribute the blood to different parts of the body. The smallest arterioles or smallest arteries are arterioles and you see a smaller lumen with very little to no elastic tissue. But again, because there's a tunica media here, vasoconstriction can um, divert blood away from a very specific capillary bed. This picture will help um, you understand the difference between vasoconstriction and vasodilation. I think you know this already, but just in case, if one arterial can dilate and it can constrict, and I don't have the normal size of an artery here, but I have um, a picture of vasoconstriction that shows a smaller lumen in um, an arteriole. And so when the tunica media contracts, the smooth muscle contracts, the vessel constricts, the lumen becomes smaller. Now that could restrict blood flow, but it also pushes the blood distally. When the tunica media relaxes, the vessel dilates and the lumen is larger. So that allows a greater volume of blood. It allows blood flow to continue but that also doesn't put any pressure on the blood, so it won't force or propel the blood. If we consider these two conditions of arterioles and how they might be supplying different organs, you can see that vasoconstriction of one uh, arteriole would divert blood away from a capillary bed, whereas vasodilation would allow blood to flow towards a capital, uh, capillary bed and a certain organ. Here's an example of how vasoconstriction and vasodilation control the amount of blood that different tissues in your body might receive. In the top diagram, blood flows from the arteriole into all the capillaries. So blood is flowing. This must be a superior vessel, something above the heart. Blood is flowing superiorly, enters this, it's called a meta-arteriole, but it enters these arteries or capillaries, if you will, arterioles and capillaries. But if it were constricted, if these vessels were constricted, then you would see that blood wouldn't flow. And constriction actually happens because of these pre-capillary sphincters, um, in part at least, located at the meta-arteriole leading into the capillary bed. So there's two different ways that we get vasoconstriction to a capillary bed. 
One is that this arterial can constrict. This meta arterial can constrict. But in addition, these precapillary sphincters, also made up of smooth muscle, can constrict. And then you would not get blood flow through the organ. So if the sphincters are closed, blood flows through only the meta arterial, but it won't go through all the capillary beds. And it bypasses the true capillaries. The second type of vessel is a capillary and Again, we see that there's different histology in different capillary beds. Um, there's three main types that differ in histological structure. These include uh, one, continuous capillaries, two, fenestrated capillaries, and three, sinusoid capillaries. Continuous capillaries are the most common. And you can see that in this case, the cells are quite close together with very little space in between cells. Therefore, they are the least permeable. And there are often tight junctions um, and something called parasites located in this region that helps limit the permeability of these capillaries. Gases would diffuse readily, oxygen, carbon dioxide, but transporters would be need, needed for some things like glucose, which is a little bit bigger. So these different vessel types are going to vary um, and this variation will determine how leaky they are, if you will. Fenestrated capillaries are found in kidneys, in the kidneys and in glands where we need to filter the blood. So they're a little bit more porous due to the fact that there are actual fenestrations or holes, if you will, that permeate the cells. And so as the blood is forced through the capillaries, substances will enter those fenestrations, but exit the blood. They're particularly effective in getting rid of waste products in our kidneys. And then finally, sinusoid capillaries are found in liver, bone marrow, and spleen, and they are the most permeable because there are huge clefts in between cells, um, as well as the presence of fenestrations, which are much larger. So they allow large substances to cross the capillary wall. And this is important. Let's think about the spleen for a second. The spleen is a location where white blood cells and red blood cells um, aggregate and are kind of stored. So blood cells have to be able to exit the bloodstream and enter the spleen tissue. So that's one example. And the liver, it's true too, and the bone marrow, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, I guess it's all. Just those two things. <laughs> Thanks. This is a picture that shows um, um, a histological prep, a slide of a nerve, a vein, and an artery in one region of the body. And it's useful to show you this because it shows you the difference in size between roughly the same type or size of um, a vein, like a large vein and a large artery etc. So here is how big the vein would be in one spot of your body and it's even off the screen. Okay, it's quite large. These are red blood cells here. Here is an artery which is again off the screen but nowhere near the size of the lumen of the vein and notice that the arterial wall is quite thick and the dark stained material are el that's elastin fibers. And just for fun, I thought I'd show you the nerve because usually arteries, veins, and nerves travel together in locations in the body. Okay, so we've talked about um, functions quite a bit already, but I just want to review these general functions of the specific vessel types, um, make sure that the key points were brought out to you or were said clearly to you. So due to the various tissues in blood vessel walls, each type of vessel 
performs a specific function in circulation of the blood. And I think this diagram might help you remember the different roles of the various types of blood vessels. Arteries distribute blood from the heart and the aorta. They also provide force with vasoconstriction and elastic recoil in order to propel blood. If too much constriction happens, then that will cause resistance that may restrict blood flow. As blood flows, resistance builds up just due to friction and distance. Capillaries have the thinnest walls and therefore they're ideal for uh, substance exchange or the exchange of materials. And veins, as they become larger and larger, expand to hold a large volume of blood and therefore are referred to as capacitance vessels or a blood reservoir. Okay, our last topic for this um, presentation is um, about vessel abnormalities or disorders that are common in a clinical environment. Sorry about that. In atherosclerosis, the lumen is usually what's obstructed. It is usually filled with lipid plaques, and these plaques are called atheromas. Atherosclerosis can occur in any vessel, but it's much more common in arteries than veins. Once an atheroma has developed, platelets stick to the vessel wall and degranulate. This causes the formation of and stimulates the tunica media to thicken. So then you do get some arteriosclerosis, which further narrows the artery. Ultimately, scar tissue is formed at the site of the erythoma or plaque right here. And scar tissue is typically connective tissue with no elasticity or recoil. If the plaque or perhaps a clot dislodges, we call it an embolus, a traveling obstruction, it could go to smaller vessels and completely obstruct blood flow. So slightly different, you still have narrowing of, a, of the lumen in both cases, but in arterial sclerosis, it's the wall, specifically the tunica interna or media that's thickened. In the case of atherosclerosis, first there was some sort of a lipid plaque that initiated obstruction. And then you may also get um, kind of a thickening of the wall, but you wouldn't necessarily have to have thickening. Okay, let's look at another type of blood vessel abnormality called an aneurysm. An aneurysm is defined as a weak point in a vessel wall. Usually this is in an artery. And that when blood enters that vessel, the wall bulges and allows blood to flow from the lumen into the wall of the vessel. So for example, right here, we have weakening of the wall and blood flows in between layers of the vessel wall. It usually occurs between the tunica media and the tunica interna, but then it can progress to the between the next two layers, the two most superficial layers. The danger, biggest danger is if pressure builds in the aneurysm, the wall of the vessel, that vessel can rupture and cause hemorrhage or blood loss. So there are various causes of aneurysms. Here I mention um, a congenital weakness. It could be that the connective tissue um, in general of the vessel wall is weak. That happens mainly in Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. Um, it happens due to trauma, sometimes bacterial infection, and it can happen in atherosclerosis or hypertension. The most common sites where this is you know, really severe would be in the abdominal aorta because that's where blood pressure is really um, high. And the circle of Willis, which has arteries that supply the brain, and then the renal arteries that supply the kidneys. 
So that's where it would be the you know the most detrimental if it occurred if aneurysm occurred there. Okay, now let's look at varicose veins, which you probably have heard of before. By definition, varicose veins are just, it's just distension of veins. So the veins become larger, the lumens get bigger. And it occurs due to venous pooling. So the more blood that sits here and presses on the valves, the more the vein will distend. So the walls of the vein won't be close enough to even allow the valves to touch anymore. So you will get backflow of blood. So the valves become lax and they allow the backflow of blood. Some complications of that besides the backflow is that the wall of the vein could weaken and you could get a rupture and that could lead to hemorrhage. But more often than not, pain and swelling are what is seen first in a clinical environment. Now there is a genetic component evidently to venous pooling and the ability for veins to distend like that, which makes sense if we think of connective tissue disorders. Um, but usually it starts as a result of standing for long periods, over years usually, obesity and pregnancy. The last type of disorder that I want to mention to you is vascular circulatory shock. Most of us have heard this term shock and there's many types of shock they can be categorized as either nervous shock or circulatory shock. And since we're discussing the circulatory system, I'm just going to talk about circulatory shock. This refers to a syndrome that results from low cardiac output. So circulatory shock is due to the consequences of having low cardiac output. The heart isn't pumping very much blood for some reason. In terms of our blood vessel subtopic, a subtype of circulatory shock is called vascular circulatory shock. And it refers to venous pooling that lowers blood return to the heart, sometimes called distributive shock. Vascular shock accounts for approximately 66% of all cases of circulatory shock, according to the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see that that's kind of shown here, 66% in that pie diagram. Um, it can be caused by standing for long periods, like what happens with varicose veins, but usually, you know, that's not enough to cause, you know, um, severe fainting or a lack of uh, blood return to the heart. Um, it's usually caused by widespread vasodilation throughout your entire body. So or I should say venodilation, really, because the immune system is probably sending out some sort of chemical causing relaxation of the vessels. And that is usually in response to a bacterial toxin or exposure to an allergen. So you get widespread vasodilation arteries get bigger, the um, capillaries don't respond so much, but the arterioles and the venules certainly will, and um, you don't get blood returned back to the heart, so the blood doesn't become oxygenated, and that becomes the real problem. Thank you, that's all for this presentation.